All right. Oh. Here we go. All right. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yep, yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, you need one of these bags. Why don't you come sit, sit over where you can hear? Hey, Jake. Come on. Yeah. You're very welcome. Take good notes, Knox. I can say that. You're very welcome. And Gretchen. Yep. Yep. Very cool. All right. Anybody else need one? A handout? Huh? Yep. Need a handout? Yep. yep. Anybody else? Yep. There you go. There you go. Yep. All right. All right, Cassie. Yep. Nathan, are you in this class today? Okay, brother. Oh, okay. Yep. He'll be up here. Anybody who needs a handout can. All right. All right, uh, welcome to uh, a class that we try to do every once in a while, and so it's about that time for us to do it again. And it's basically a church information class, so um, uh, it's for those who want to know more about things like we're considering this afternoon, like what is the biblical basis for church membership, why do we, um, why do we join ourselves to, uh, as members of the church, We'll give some consideration to uh, Lord willing in the next uh, time around, uh, perhaps uh, doctrine and creeds and confessions, why we have those in the life of the church. Uh, we'll take up the, um, the form of Presbyterian church government so that you can better understand uh, the scriptural basis for why we are Presbyterian. Uh, we'll take up some matters uh, concerning the distinctives of our church, why we sing only the Psalms in worship, why we don't use musical instruments in worship. Uh, covenanting and um, mediatorial kingship of Christ and all those fun subjects, uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll get through. But we're going to have to do this pretty quickly. Today we're just going to look at church membership. In the, the coming weeks, we might have to combine a couple things together to get through it before the, the close of the, uh, the uh, Sabbath school year here. All right, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our study. Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that uh, we have uh, yet another occasion on this day that you set apart to spend time with one another and to give attention to your word and to take up uh, the subject that is before us this afternoon. And so we ask your blessing upon our time now and pray that you will bless us and um, bless uh, especially those uh, young ones among us who are giving consideration uh, to whether or not they are ready to make the next step to become communicant members of the church. So we pray for an extra blessing upon them. And we do ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the, when it comes to the subject of church membership, there are various objections that people uh, come up with as to why they, they don't uh, believe in church membership. Uh, some reject it uh, because they think it smacks of Roman Catholicism. Right? So some Protestants will say, that sounds too Roman Catholic to be a member of the church. Um, some reject it because they simply believe that it's a man-made tradition, that it's an invention that uh, men have made up, that it's not scriptural. Um, some reject it because they've adopted that popular motto, me and my Bible is all that I need to be a Christian. I don't need the church. I don't need to be a member of the church. But the ironic thing about people who reject church membership on the basis that they don't think it's biblical and who think all they need is the Bible, is that the very Bible that they claim to hold in such high esteem is the very same Bible that teaches the importance of having a formal relationship to the church. Um, now, like many doctrines, we're not going to be able to turn to a particular passage of Scripture that tells us thou must be a member of a church, right? You're not going to find that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, we, we don't have Scriptures which state the doctrine of the Trinity that plainly either, right? So, uh, for that matter, we can just as easily say, show me where the Bible says women are to partake of the Lord's Supper, right? These, all these things come by way of good and necessary consequence. We deduce these things as we uh, take the scriptures all in together to consider what they have to say about whatever subject it is we are considering. The same thing is true about uh, baptism, infant baptism. We had a, 
infant baptized this morning. And again, you wouldn't be able to say, look, at, there's that passage of scripture. It says, you, you know, babies are to be baptized. No, it's, a, it's an argument that considers the whole counsel of God weighing in on the subject that we look at. And to make the point further, uh, I could use this same line of reasoning uh, in this way. I could say, show me where in the Bible it says, don't run over pedestrians with your car. Where does it say that? Right? If, if I can't show you a verse that tells you not to do that, does that mean then it's okay to do so? That's a silly way of thinking, isn't it? We don't think that way in any other aspect of life. So we shouldn't think that we're going to get away with that when we look at the scriptures and what the scriptures teach. Now, we don't need explicit verses to tell us not to kill or not to harm people in every way conceivable because we know that the general command or the general rule tells us to love our neighbor right? and to, to look out for the good of our neighbor and to promote their good health. And so we take the general principle of loving our neighbor and we apply it to each particular circumstance as it's appropriate. And this is what our, um, what our confession means when it talks about this idea of good and necessary consequence in chapter 1 in section 6. It says there that the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from scripture, okay? So we learn then about the importance of church membership because it's deduced by applying that same principle of good and necessary consequence to the subject at hand. So we're gonna begin. And uh, we begin with the point in Roman numeral one in your uh, handout. And that is we're taking up the nature of the church, the nature of the church. There's a distinction <clears throat> as it concerns the church between the visible and the invisible aspect of the church, right? Um, who could tell us what is the invisible church? The invisible church in your head? No, but, but it, it's a part of what we think about the church in our head, yeah. Uh, what's the invisible church? Yes, George. Everybody God looks at and says they're in, part, they're in the church. Yeah. So the invisible... Past and present. Yes, yeah, so the invisible church is all who are true Christians, all who are truly saved, going back to Adam and Eve all the way to, 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 to our current time, right? So, uh, and those who are in heaven are, make, are part of the invisible church, and all the true believers on earth right now are part of the invisible church. It's that church that we, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the, 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 that aspect of the church that we can't see with our own eyes, right? Uh, we can't know exactly who the elect are. Uh, there are believers uh, there are true believers and, and unbelievers within the context of the church, and we don't have the ability to see that distinction. We can't recognize all who are true Christians, right? And that's the invisible church is made up of only true Christians, all who are truly saved, all right? Um, the visible church is that part of the church that we do see with our eyes, and it's made up of all believers and their children, right? All who make a profession of faith together with their children make up the visible church, and uh, we have an example of that here uh, in our midst. So there is this distinction as it concerns the nature of the church. Um, the bride of Christ uh, is the church, right? And, and, uh, and it's also our mother. And the church is our mother, and the church is also the bride of Christ. If Christ had so loved his church to take her as his bride then the question naturally arises, shouldn't we also then desire to be joined to his bride? Jesus died for his bride, the church, to, to, to bring her to himself, to, be, to have that union with her. And so if the Lord was willing to do that in order to have his people belong to his church, how much more should we, who claim to be his people, desire to be united to his church, to be part of it, right? Cyprian, uh, an early church father, said, no, no one can have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. And uh, again, that's not, a, that's not a verse from scripture, but it makes the point, doesn't it? How can you claim to have God as your father who, who, and not be united to his church? It, the, the very, the very um, uh, institution that he gave to nurture uh, his people. Yeah? 
Uh, the church is also referred to in Scripture as a household or a family. And uh, have here Ephesians 2.19. Who would read that for us? Ephesians 2.19. It's in your, all of these are printed out in your handout. Or are they? Are they not printed out in your handout? Yeah, they are. Okay. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Okay. So, what's this, what is Paul talking about in Ephesians 2? Anybody? That's Becky. That we're all like brothers and sisters in Christ, like that we're all part of the same family. Family, yeah. He calls it a household, right? He's talking about the church. <clears throat> Those who've been, um, who were once strangers and aliens to the covenants of promise. He talks about that earlier in chapter 2. And um, now... We are those who have hope, and we are those who are joined together with the rest of the believers, the rest of the saints, and he says, members of the household of God. It's a reference to the church. The church is the household of God. In uh, Galatians 6.10, who would read that for us? Yes, Don. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Okay, so you have a reference there to household. Again, this is a reference to the church. The church is referred to as a household, right? We're part of a family. Who would uh, read for us our Confession of Faith, chapter 25, section 2? Oh, yes, J Jake. The visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, not confined to one nation as before under the law, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children. And is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. Okay, thank you. So um, I would just draw your attention to the bold there, the house and family of God. This is a, uh, chapter 25 is of the church. It's about the church. And our confession it confesses, and we confess with it uh, together, uh, that the church is the house and family of God of God, and we would even confess out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. Now, if you've uh, studied the New Testament at all, you'll know that back in the day, churches met in houses, right? There were house churches, and um, which also then illustrates this intimate nature of the church being a household or a family. Um, we see some examples of uh, uh, in the scriptures of this, in Romans 16.3, somebody will read that for us. 16.3. Yes, Shelly. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Okay. So we see there that there was a church, a congregation, that was meeting in the house of Priscilla and Aquila, right? And uh, very fitting uh, that they would meet in a house because the church is called a household, the household of God, right? Colossians 4.15, who would read that for us? Dale had a great <laughs> <laughs> Go, Dale. Greet the brethren who are laid to see you in Ephesus and the church that is in his house. Okay. Yeah, and the same thing we see in Philemon and also in Acts 20, 20, right? In Acts 20, 20, in fact, um, Paul is recounting his ministry as he's about to leave the saints at Ephesus there. And um, he says, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but I proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. And uh, those are congregations meeting in people's houses, and he was teaching uh, the people of God uh, as the church of God. Um, how about um, Hebrews 2, 11, and 12? Who would read that for us? Don? Oh, Nathan. Thank you. For both of you who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, which for, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Okay, so here we have uh, a reference to the church and the people who make up the church as being the brethren. What, what does that mean, brethren? What do we mean when we talk about the brethren? Brothers and sisters, Brothers and sisters in Christ, yeah. So collectively, it's the, 
men and women uh, who make up, and the children who make up the church, right? We're all brethren. We're all part. And to, uh, brethren is another reference to family, right? It's family. Um, you'll notice that, I mean, if we know Jesus in a saving way, then we know him as our elder brother. And if we know him as our elder brother and as our savior and Lord, we should desire then to join ourselves to his household, wherein he is pleased then to strengthen, to nourish, to sanctify, and to build us up through the ministry and through the gifts of the local body. Part of the design of the church is to be a, a house for God's people to be strengthened and nourished in, to be fed in. Okay? And uh, so the Lord has given us um, officers in the church to, to meet those needs. But you need to belong to the church in order to benefit uh, from these things. Now let's look at what the Old Testament, let's look at the origin of church, the idea of church membership. And um, I begin by noting the genealogies that we find throughout the scriptures of the Old Testament. Uh, the census that is uh, referred to and taken in Exodus 30 and verse 11, the whole book of Numbers, right? You ever read how, you, all, how many names are in the, the front part of the book of Numbers, right? Tons of names. Now, why do you think that is? What, what are we to glean from the fact that you have all these genealogies and all these names and records of people uh, uh, who, are, uh, who lived back then? What, what is the point of that? Yeah, it helps us uh, know where everybody comes from. Like yeah. The whole story of the book. Right, so we get a history, all right, a genealogical history uh, lesson from that. And they, and yeah. I think they, they uh, eventually lead to Jesus Christ. Yeah, they all do, yeah. They have one line, right, that actually makes its way all the way to Christ, right? Exactly right. Yes, Pat. Dale. Miles didn't mention that yet. The seed of Christ was promised through important to know, you got to keep track of that, you want to know, you know, as these prophecies come to pass, that they're, you know, being fulfilled as they were, you know, these. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, as you see that, as you follow the family line, you're going to see, you, you come to that wonderful conclusion, and then you come to the New Testament, and it goes back, right, takes that genealogy, that Old Testament genealogy, and completes it, pointing us uh, to Jesus Christ. Brian. Yes, yes, and that's what, as it applies to what we're looking at here. That's, that, that, that's what I wanted to highlight. Um, these are people who belong to the household of faith. Okay? These are people who have their names even uh, associated with the household of faith. Yes, George. It often seems like pointing out the negative, but it's true. There is a distinction between those who are in and those who are not in. Yep. It's not a vague amorphous group of people, at least when you're talking about the genealogy, when they speak of the household of faith and they're enumerated, mm -hmm. you glean from that that there is a distinction from those who belong. Yep. Not that, that there, it's, a, it's a nanny, nanny, boo, boo, you don't belong to us. Right. It's not like the He-Man Woman Hater Club or something like <laughs> that. It's simply that there are people who are part of this family, of this household, and then obviously there are those who are not. That's right. It's or at least not yet. Not yet, right. And, but, and it is a privileged group to belong to, right? I mean, this is, this is not my household. It's not your household. It's God's household, right? And Jesus is the king and head of it. And um, he is our husband. And so he's the head of the home, as it were. And, and we, uh, we have these lists of names of people, even in times past, who belong to the same church. And let me add to this. The idea of excommunications, um, that's an Old Testament uh, teaching as well, right? What would, ha what would happen to some people who refuse to repent for various sins? Out of camp. Kicked out of the camp. Exiled. Cut off from the people. Exiled. Uh, those are excommunications. And so think about it. To, uh, to be excommunicated uh, shows that it implies that you had to, be had to have belonged to something in order to be kicked out of something. And so what that tells us is that in the Old Testament, there was the church. There was still the church. Just like we have the church today, you have the church of the Old Covenant. And they had membership. 
We see that proven with all these names and lists and genealogies of people who belong to the church together with the excommunications. Those all point to the same truth, that there was a people of God. There was a church of God in the Old Covenant. We also have uh, references um, throughout um, the scriptures with regard to this um, um, book of life that is referred to. I'm trying to see if we want to go there yet. Um, I think we do. Turn to Exodus 32, 32. And who could read that first? Exodus 32, 32, and then jump down to 46 and read that verse also for us. Who would do that for us? Yes, thank you. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, walk me out of your book, which you have written. And then that's 46. Yeah. 36? Maybe 36. I don't know. I got... Uh, Misprint. They only answered like 35, I think it was a chapter 33. Hmm, I don't know, I'll have to go back and look at that one. 33 says, and the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will block him out of my book. Maybe it's 32, 33 is what it was intended there. But yeah, the point being is that uh, Moses is speaking to the Lord, right? And, um, and the Lord... Uh, reveals to him that, you know, how did he come, did, did Moses make up the fact that there's a, some, something, bo some book that's being written in by God? And it, it, of course, it's not literal, right? Uh, but God is keeping record of something. I mean, what is he keeping record of? Our words. He is doing that. But um, yeah, because he talks about that, right? They're going to open the books up. We'll be judged by that. But, um, but as it pertains to church membership, yeah, so the book of life, right? It's about those who have eternal life. And uh, those are the people who are part of his church. Okay. Um, same reference in Revelation 13, 8. That, uh, maybe somebody can just read a... I get two volunteers. Somebody to read 13, 8, 17, 8. And then somebody to read 20, 12, and 15. All right, Becky, you could do uh, 13, 8, and 17, 8. And then uh, somebody else do 20, 12, and 15. Okay, yes, yeah, Gretchen, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And then Gretchen, 20, 12, and 15. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of love. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, thank you. So we have these references. Um, these mentionings of uh, people who, whose names are written in the book of life and those who are not. And you'll notice, um, it, and it refers to this, the, the names having been added to that book before the foundation of the world. What, what does that lend itself to? Predestination. Predestination, yeah. It's, it, we elect, the elect of God. Uh, even before Jesus came into this world, even before creation, God already had a list of people. And so that also tells us that when Jesus came to die on the cross and to pay the penalty for the sins of his people, he knew those for whom he was atoning, right? It was those whose names were written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. And so there was no chance Christ was not going to accomplish the mission for which he was sent. 
So he, he certainly has guaranteed and he's made sure that um, all of his people, all of his people will be saved of their sins. Okay. So um, one more passage, Psalm 69, verses 9 and 10. Psalm 69, 9 and 10, and uh, verse 28 as well from that psalm. Who has that? Okay, well, uh, when you get that, and 10, and then verse 28. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. And then 28? Yeah. You're good. Old eyes. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Okay. So, again, another reference to this book. But uh, I want to read a quote from uh, Dr. Clark. Um, I have it in your um, in your notes. And a uh, really good quote. He says, um, in Psalm 69, 28, David prays for the utter destruction of enemies and for them to be blotted out of the book of life and not to be listed with the righteous. In this same psalm in verses 9 and 10, David turns from the book to speak twice of the kahal, which is translated in the Septuagint with ecclesia and synagogue. And you've got cross references here where the two ideas are closely connected. And he says that there's a close connection then in David's mind between the kahal, the covenant assembly, and the book. God commanded Moses, he says, to take a census of the people and to make a record of them in Exodus 30. And Psalm 87, verse 6, speaks of the, a register of the peoples. And Ezekiel 13, 9 speaks of a register of the house of Israel. Uh, there, was written record, there was a written record of the descendants of Aaron in Numbers 3.10. And it would seem to be beyond controversy that God's people kept written records during the Mosaic theocracy. The question remains then whether similar practices continued on into the New Covenant era. So, I, I, you know, the point is, is that there has, uh, God's people have um, been recording the names of his people uh, and those who belong to him and to his church for a long time. And uh, so it's not a new idea. This idea of church membership and having your names on a register or on a roll of the church is not a new idea. It's an Old Testament rooted practice, right? And the thing that we see, that God himself keeps a list of names in the book of life, and there's a register on earth that you hope is close to that of the book of life in heaven, right? That's our, uh, we, we, you hope that it's, <laughs> there's much agreement between those two registers, but we know there's not. Um, there are some who are unbelievers uh, in the church, and that's just uh, the, the wheat and the tares parable, uh, paints that picture for us clearly. All right, so that's the Old Testament, right? So it's the, how this idea of church membership is rooted in the Old Testament. Now let's look at the New Testament. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Who would read that? Yes, Jake. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay. Amen. Amen. What would be the context for all the things Jesus is commanding there in the Great Commission? Where are those things to be done? George? In the church. In the church. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, you, you baptize people. The church has been given the means, uh, the sacraments, right? The church administers the sacraments. Church is to disciple the nations, to teach the nations the things that Jesus has instructed uh, us to believe and to, and to obey and to do, right? That all takes place in the context of the church. So um, Acts 2.41, and uh, we got a few there. Uh, we won't read all these, but uh, suffice it to say, uh, these new converts, right, uh, after Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, we are told that they were added 
to the church. These people were added to the church. Now, how would you think they were added to the church? How, how, how does that happen? Baptism. By baptism. And you would think there's some kind of a registry of people who've been baptized, right? Um, uh, in 1 Timothy 5, 9, uh, there's this registry for uh, widows, a role of widows. Well, where does that role exist? In the church, <laughs> right? In the church. Um, Acts 6, um, the appointment of deacons was in the context of widows who belonged to the church who were being neglected, right? So they set them apart to go do that work for those widows who were in the church. They were members of the church. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Now, um, look at that closely and you'll see there are people who labor, who have been called to labor among those in the church. And, the, and, and, and Paul is telling them, um, recognize them and esteem them for their work's sake. That's, again, in the context of the church. First Peter 5.5, 5, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. How can you have elders who are over you if you don't belong to the church? Right? Um, I can't, uh, just because I'm an elder doesn't mean I can have oversight over all Christians everywhere. I'm not like a pope where I have this authority over everybody that calls themselves a Christian. No, I've been called to serve this church, and my authority is limited, right, in a certain sense, to the oversight of this congregation. Now, certainly I have a role to play in Presbyterian Synod and what have you, but point being is that just because, um, you know, you have to have that relationship. There has to be a formal relationship in order for this to exist, in order for you to have elders and to have a pastor and deacons, uh, they serve the flock, the local congregation. Okay? Um, in Hebrews 13, 17, the same thing. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. So, you know, in all of these passages, you, you, it's easy to see that there's, um, there's a presumption of a formal relationship that exists between those who are in leadership and those who belong to the flock. Um, in the passage from Hebrews, it, it, again, he says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. The, the relationship is between rulers in the church and those who, uh, over whom they rule or over whom they, they oversee. Uh, the passage from 1 Thessalonians, uh, again, says much the same thing. And in 1 Peter, same thing, right? All of these passages are pointing to the same thing. So the scriptures presume a formal relationship between sheep and shepherds or under shepherds. I mean, after all, how can we submit or obey our pastors or our elders if we don't belong then to a particular church? And um, uh, surely it's not right to think, again, as I just mentioned, that all elders and all pastors have, have a role of authority in all, of Christ all Christians everywhere. That just doesn't make sense. And it's the same way you can think about a husband and a wife relationship. The husband's ahead of his home. He's ahead of his wife. Uh, but that doesn't mean he has any authority in anybody else's home. Uh, you know, Nathan can't come into my house and then say, you know, Julie, this is, uh, I'm gonna, this is what you're going to do now for uh, next week. I want you to do X, Y, Z. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a limited authority, right? And it's, it comes in a certain context. And, um, and we do well to guard that context and to recognize it, to recognize it, because ultimately it's for our good. All of this is for our good. Um, think about also Matthew 18, right? What's that passage about? George? Reconciliation or prop, uh, conflict, yep. resolving conflict in the church. Yep. So it's a go-to text for church discipline, right, and for working out matters uh, in the in in the church in the church, so um, at a certain uh, we're told that whenever a believer is confronted by another believer for their sin, that person won't listen to them after they've been confronted, and he or she has to go and take two other witnesses with them to try to talk with them about it. If it doesn't get resolved after those couple steps, what ha what is the, what is the command? What are you supposed to do at that point? Take it to the church. Take it to the church. Which church? The one that agrees. 
Yeah, your, your church, right? Your church. Um, and this is, and this is in the, and this is in the context of brothers who belong to the same congregation. Brothers and sisters belong to the same congregation, right? So you take it to the church. That means to take it to the elders that oversee the church, right? And um, and then the elders take it from there. But again. Uh, how can that be done if a person isn't a member of any particular church? How do you, how do you practice Matthew 18 if you don't belong to a church? Uh, you can't. Uh, how would you know which elders to tell the matter to if you don't belong to a local congregation? Right. So the passage becomes meaningless, uh, as do the others that we've mentioned, if there's no such thing as this formal relationship of church membership. The Apostle Paul, in light of the church discipline case that took place in 1 Corinthians 5, he said to, to put such a person out. You remember that? To excommunicate a person when they remain obstinate in unrepentant sin, um, they're to be cast out, they're to be excommunicated. Well, again, how does one get put out of something if they don't formally belong to it in the first place? How do, how do people get excommunicated if they're not members in the first place? Now, it's important to note also then that the Lord didn't set uh, elders in the church for the purpose of carrying out church discipline, uh, uh, but he has. He has also provided elders and and, um, pastors for the nourishment and protection of the sheep. So not only has he given uh, elders for the purpose of carrying out church discipline, but also more than that. It's not just that, right? Uh, We, we, uh, pastors and elders aren't just looking for sin in the camp and trying to uh, bring attention to all the sin in the camp. There's uh, something else that we are called to do, and that is we are to provide nourishment and protection for the congregation, for the sheep. Okay? Um, in fact, this is the, uh, the first of, of three reasons that the preacher uh, to the Hebrews gives as to why we should obey our pastors and our elders. If you look at verse 17 again of that quote, of that verse, he says that we're to do this because they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. You see, we need to understand that overseers are actually a blessing, and they are to be a blessing to the church. Pastors and elders are given to the church to care for the church and to provide her with teaching and preaching and oversight and order, that the, and order that she needs. And, and we know that this is the case because Jesus is the one who made these provisions for his bride. When Jesus raised on high, he gave gifts to men, Ephesians 4. Um, he, uh, therefore, he says, verse 11, verse 8, therefore, he says, um, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men, in verse 11, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers uh, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So pastors and elders are given to be a blessing in these ways for the church. And and isn't it interesting that his giving these gifts to men is directly tied to his ascension. Catch that? Indeed, these gifts are given so that the church can be taken care of while Jesus is away in heaven. Jesus himself cared for his church while he was walking on earth, right? Uh, But now that he's ascended on high, he's given these gifts to the church so that through him, ministers and elders can, can care for the needs of the church and provide for the church. We read um, in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, uh, Peter says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd, this is a command from the apostles, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And then when the chief 
shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. The Lord gave the church pastors and elders to care for and to nourish and to protect his sheep. And, um, and this is exactly what pastors and elders are to do. Uh, you recall that after uh, Peter had fallen, the, how when, uh, when he was restored by Jesus, one of the things uh, Jesus told Peter was what? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Pastors are to be shepherds to the sheep, caring for them, providing nourishment for them, and protecting them. Um, the Apostle Paul, when he was uh, leaving the church at Ephesus, he gathered the elders together there in the 20th chapter of Acts. And then in verses 28 to 31, he said, Therefore, he's speaking to the elders, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch, says the Apostle Paul. So one of the reasons the preacher gives for why sheep should obey and submit to their pastors and elders is because it's for their own good to do so. They watch out for our souls. Uh, pastors and elders are supposed to be gifts to the bride from the bridegroom. And these gifts are intended to be a help and a blessing. Uh, and they prove to be this, right, when the relationship works out as, it, as, it's, uh, as it's supposed to. Right? Now, when it comes to the authority, then, of the pastors and elders, it's important to note that any authority that pastors and elders have, or, or deacons even, as, uh, with regard to their realm of authority, uh, all authority in the church is a delegated authority. All church, all authority in the church is a delegated authority. And this authority, therefore, is not absolute. It is not unqualified um, in the sense that we must obey all that we're told implicitly with blind obedience. That's not what we're called to do. Okay? The kind of obedience, that kind of obedience is, is owed only to God and to God alone. Whatever God says, whether you understand it or not, is what you're supposed to do, right? You don't question him and say, why, Lord, would you have me to do this? You do it because he tells you to do it. But that's not true of elders and pastors or deacons. It's not an absolute authority. It's a delegated authority. They can only command you to do, to do the things that the Lord himself uh, commands us to do. Yeah. If an elder or a pastor tells us or counsels us to do something that we know is contrary to the word of God, then we must obey God rather than man. Okay? Um, we are to respect and to submit in the Lord to those whom the Lord has set apart to be overseers. And uh, this is certainly what the scriptures teach. And it's the very basis, by the way, for the, one of the membership vows that we take when we become members of this church. In our fourth vow, we're coming to the end here, in the fourth vow, you promise that um, this. Do you promise to submit in the Lord to the teaching and government of this church as being based upon the scriptures and described in substance in the constitution of the RPCNA? And it goes on to say, in case you should need correction in doctrine or life, do you promise to respect the authority and the discipline of the church? So this is something that God's people, at least the members of this uh, denomination, uh, all affirm, that they're going to recognize the uh, pastors and elders and the, the authority that comes in uh, that is in the church through the officers of the church and you respect it now um, and this is a, that's an important vow to understand um, becoming a member of a particular congregation is an important matter it's something that we all ought to do and when we do so we ought to take our vows seriously right these are you when you take a vow, you're taking a vow before the Lord, okay? Uh, these are vows that we make before the Lord, and in these vows, we're promising to submit, and we're promising to obey and to respect those who are pastors and elders 
And even deacons in the church. Deacons also carry some weight within the congregation, and I think that's uh, to be noted. Um, these are the vows that we take, and we're promising to, to obey and respect uh, these officers. And so for this reason, whomever it is that we elect to be our pastors and elders is an extremely important decision. Because these are the men that, that we're vowing to submit to and obey in the Lord. If you don't have respect for the guy, uh, you know, in, in just generally speaking, well, how will you ever find it in your, in your heart and mind and soul to submit to him? How, how, it's impossible, right? You've got to have respect for somebody before you're going to submit to them. Now, sometimes people can use the hammer to come down. You, just, you do things out of fear. And that, we already talked about that. That's wrong. That's wrong. But you need to have respect. And so when it comes to choosing uh, elders and deacons and pastors, uh, as God gives you opportunity to do that as his people, you want to make sure that they meet the qualifications and that you can look at that person and say, yeah, I respect that person. I can, I can submit to that person. Because yeah. after, be, uh, after they come into office, you owe your respect to them. Whether you had it or not, you still need to outwardly show that respect to them. Yeah? Because you're, you're, you take a vow along those lines. Now, there is, uh, I'm going to conclude with this. There is a, um, in that passage from Hebrews, there's a warning um, there. Uh, the preacher to the Hebrews says uh, why it is we should obey and submit our, to our leaders is because they watch out for their souls as for your souls as those who must give account the elders must give an account uh, in a similar way that that parents are stewards of their children and therefore are accountable before the lord for how they raise their children so is it also then the case that pastors and elders are held accountable before the lord in how they care for the flocks that they've been appointed to oversee and um, the question would be then is how can there be any true accounting if there's no formal relationship between the leadership and the flock? I conclude with a final quote from Dr. Clark. He says, uh, a membership role is a natural function in a structured, organized institution. We have strong evidence from scripture that the church was intentionally instituted with structure and offices. It's possible to be included and excluded from the visible church. That leads us to think then that membership is implied by the very idea of inclusion and exclusion. Further, he says, we know from scripture that God has always kept a list, as it were, of his people. The Israelites kept a census which constituted a membership role in the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant typological state church. We know that the inner testamental and New Testament era synagogues kept membership roles. And we reasonably think that the New Testament church inherited that practice. We have positive evidence of some lists, for instance, the widows, it was kept in the church, that is kept in the church. And so it seems hard to imagine, he says, that there were roles for widows, but not for members. Uh, so I think that's a, a, good, uh, a good quote there. It makes a good case based on all that we've considered this afternoon that uh, it is very important uh, to be a member of the church. And um, I, looking here, uh, everybody here is, I think, members of this congregation so far. Oh, so maybe not Pat, not yet. Uh, hope maybe one day, but... That is important. That is important. Something to consider. Uh, we ought to be long ourselves, to be, to join ourselves to uh, a church of, of the Lord in a formal manner um, for the, all the reasons that were stated uh, in this lecture. Uh, questions or comments? Yes, Don. Um, how will the argument against church membership go? Well, as I mentioned at the outset, um, there might be some people uh, who would say, I just, I, I, I'm a believer. I, I, I'm, uh, it's just me and my Bible. That's all I need, man. You know? You know what I'm saying? Like, is there like something in the Bible that they're pointing to? No. Their argument? No. I mean, they, they would say, they would make the arguments um, along the lines of, for instance, like, um, well, God knows my heart. I, I don't need men to, 
to be involved in my walk with Jesus, right? I, I, I'm just walking with Jesus, man. <laughs> you know, leave me alone. Uh, and you might float from church to church and wherever they think there might be some good teaching, they might come in to hear every once in a while or, but kind of like, you know, not, not, not committing themselves to any particular congregation. Yeah. George, you going to weigh in on that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a takeoff. Yep. It's both question and comment. Basically, I'm going to answer my own question. The, uh, the issue that I think of when I think of that is why would somebody want to default to that position? The, it's me and my Bible, or I have faith in the Lord. The Bible says I have faith, so therefore I'm a believer. Why do I need to be involved in the formal yeah. church or the formal religion? And you have to wonder why. And I think my experience, having walked, talked to people uh, about this, a lot of it comes from bad experience. Yeah. They, I'll just classify it as bad experience because it's usually twofold. One, they've been abused by an abusive church. Yep. Or two, they've been pig-headed and not wanted to submit to something within that church. Either one of them causes them to be, as you say, schismatic or to step out away from it. So to me, the, the, the question is, why would you want to do that? And usually it goes down to bad church experience. Yeah. And, and then that's when I would talk somebody through much what you've done here. It's like, look, you can talk about, there's many, many verses in here that talk about the believer having faith, that's all you need. Thief on the cross, yeah. that's obviously not prescriptive, it's descriptive. Yeah. And the point being that you can't be under the elders. They can't have account for you. They're, the marks of the church are the preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments, and discipline of the church. If you can't sit under discipline, and remember, discipline, we always think of it as a pattern or doing something wrong. But the root is the same as disciple, yep. that means student, yep. or that one who is taught. Yep. So without that relationship, you're bobbing around in an ocean, and you're not anchored to anything. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, my, my way of doing it. Today. But my honest question is, what about the church? What about the elders who took a left turn at Albuquerque? What about the ones who were given bad teaching, bad doctrine? You, you want to be under these elders, but you can tell oh. that the denomination or this particular congregation, whichever it may be, right. is doing crazy. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, for me, I, I, I can discern where that is, but, yeah. but a lot of people, they may not know. Yeah. Well, that's a hard question, and it takes a lot of discernment to be able to figure that out. Because, um, I mean, no church is perfect, right? Uh, there's, um, uh, and and uh, many churches, including ours, don't require strict subscription to everything that is taught in our standards. Um, but uh, that's not to say, though, that if uh, all of a sudden I start teaching something really strange, like, like uh, I don't know, uh, pedo communion. Let's say a pastor went pedo communion. Now he wants our infants to start taking communion. Well, I mean... In a Presbyterian context, you have some recourse. So, you know, then you say, go to the elder and say, hey, what's Steve doing, man? You know, have you guys talked to him about that? It would be their duty, first of all, to try to talk me out of it and persuade me of the truth. Um, and if uh, I just don't agree, well, then that's going to be ending up with me out of the pulpit rather than members leaving because of my bad teaching, right? So there's a, a real, we'll get to this when we get to Presbyterianism, but there's a real guard and protection for the sheep in a Presbyterian form of church government. Uh, there's recourse. Now, uh, in churches where they don't have that, uh, most, you know, most of the church out there is independent and congregational. So in those cases, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, where do you draw the line? Is it just simply as long as the gospel is being taught and preached that that's good enough and everything else that you can take it or leave it just depending on what you think of the subject? Well, I guess if you don't have a particular standard, the church doesn't have a confession of faith, it kind of is a free-for-all. And I don't, I don't know what I would say to somebody if they were in a church like that. Because, I mean, part of your problem is that you have no, no confession of faith yourself to, to hold things against. Um, so uh, I, it's a hard question. I, I think I would encourage that person to really think through, are there, 
are there other doctrines uh, in the Bible that are important and important enough uh, to go look for another church? Uh, and I think the answer is yes, but, uh, but you'd have to want to, spend, you'd want to spend some time with them to talk through those things uh, to give them good counsel. Uh, you know, the other, Don, getting back to your question, the other thing is I think sometimes people, uh, the whole idea of uh, the church being an institution, people don't like institutionalized religion. Yeah, organized religion. Um, and, uh, and that can come down to kind of what George is talking about, bad experiences in the formal church, the organized church. Um, but that's a poor reason uh, to, to, to not join yourself to it. Um, because, uh, you know, the Lord, has, the Lord is the one who's given organization to his religion. Uh, this is God's religion. This is his, you know, this is his church. And he's, he's the one who commands us to be, belong to it in a formal sense. So, you know, people that take issue with that are really take issue with the Lord and, and, and church history, right? This is not a new teaching. The church has always understood these things, right? And it's always uh, had some sense of church membership. It's not, as we looked at, we had the Old Testament and all the examples we see there. We got, the, as was mentioned, the intertestamental period. Then we got the New Testament period. All of these, throughout all the period of the, of the existence of the church, there's been this formal relationship of, of membership, in the church. I think Jake and then Dale. Uh, Dale, are you going to piggyback on that? Yeah, okay, so, Jake, uh, you're off here. You know, piggybacking on all three of those things is what you're mentioning. People kicking back on organized religion. It's funny because most of those people are going to be coming out of what we call Big Eva or, or the Big Evangelical Church, which usually doesn't have authority because it's usually some independent guy coming out doing his own thing. And the church is typically run like a big corporation, like a business, not even run like a church probably. And I mean those I mean if you meet someone like that, I, I think it's important to kind of point out those things. First of all, this church wasn't built on a on apostolic succession. They, they probably had no authority to be even preaching the word, you know, who laid hands on, on this individual for one. And secondly, is this organized religion actually run like the religion that God has revealed in Scripture? Probably not. Right. Right. Yeah, well said, brother. Yeah. Jake? So as far as objections to the idea of church membership, I remember a dispute with a friend a long time ago. You get excommunicated from this friend's perspective. Ooh, they cross your name out of the membership role. How terrible. But I remember... You know, I still remember one time sitting at lunch, uh, I don't know, if, I think it was the Heidelberg Catechism, might have been the Belgian Confession, but that connection between uh, church discipline and what happens in heaven, and when I saw that what actually happens in membership on earth is reflective of what has actually happened mm. in heaven, you see, okay, so this really is serious, and there is a real authority here, and so to me, you know, if there is not a correlation between those two, then yeah, um, church membership is superfluous. But if there, you know, if what Jesus says is true, what you find on earth is found in heaven. What you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. Then yes, uh, to be a member or not to be a member is a very serious thing because it does say a lot about somebody's true actual standing for Christ, mm. even in current day. Well said. Thank you, brother. Yeah. All right. Yeah, George. I also want to mention, I don't agree with the practice, per se, but it's illustrative of this being, like you said, always within the church. You pointed it out in Scripture, how do you have the role of widows if you don't even have the role of the church? Yeah. Things of that nature. But you can go back as early as memory serves in the late 300s, mid to late 300s. They had this concept of the dismissal of the catechumens. Yeah. And that meant those who, like, they used to keep them as Christians in training, mm -hmm. the catechumens, until they came to faith. And they would have the sacraments, and then there would be a portion before the sacraments where they would dismiss the catechumens because this meal is not for you because you're not part of the body of Christ yet. Now, that whole concept, that's debatable. But conceptually, it yeah. shows the fact that there is a formal 
membership within the body. Yeah, amen, amen. And that's as early as the two, three hundred. Yeah, yeah. Good. All good stuff, folks. Uh, so hopefully uh, you see then the importance of church membership. It is a biblical uh, thing. The Bible teaches it. And uh, so we ought to encourage it uh, and encourage other people to join themselves to the church. Uh, all right. Uh, let's conclude with prayer. Um, oh, Brian, would you, would you close this prayer, please? Yes, By the grace of God, again, we thank you that you are God, that you are our God, that you are building your church. We do thank you that you have given uh, your church authority, that you have given your church members. And it is important for us to look and think upon these things as we understand our place uh, within your creation and within your body. We do thank you for this time together. We thank you for uh, the fellowship we enjoy, for the communion we enjoy with you as we hear your word preached. Pray that you would be uh, blessing us as we go from this place and go about our week. And we would be uh, thinking on all that you've heard today, that we would be looking to apply all that we've heard today and be conformed to the image of Christ as you grow us in grace and wisdom and knowledge and conform us to his image by your spirit. Bless us now as we go from here. Forgive us our many sins, for it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Amen.